This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, we're privileged now to welcome to our lectern one of the world's leading ethicists in Professor Nigel Bigger. Nigel is the Regis Professor of Moral and Pastoral Theology at the University of Oxford. He is also the McDonald Distinguished Scholar at the University of Oxford. He directs the McDonald Center for Theology, Ethics, and Public Life, which has hosted a number of cutting-edge programs on issues of economics and warfare, social welfare, public policy, and much more. Especially notable was his hosting of a major McDonald conference in 2012 on Christianity and the flourishing of the modern university, which featured a number of the McDonald distinguished scholars from around the world, and each of them uh, will have an opportunity over the next five years to appear here too. He set a standard of excellence in that conference to which we all aspire. Professor Bigger writes astutely and prolifically on issues of political theology and military ethics, bioethics, post-conflict reconciliation, using the refined tools of theology, philosophy, history, and ethics alike. Amongst his many publications are a new book, In Defense of War, just out with Oxford University Press, where he engages deeply uh, Professor Hauerwas, also included in his long list of titles, Behaving in Public, How to Do Christian Ethics, Religious Voices in Public Places, Aiming to Kill, Bearing the Past, and a forthcoming title, Between Kin and Cosmopolis. Deeply, grat deeply grateful for his efforts to come across the Atlantic uh, to visit the colonists and to have an opportunity to edify us with his instruction, I gratefully give you Professor Nigel Bigger, our next lecturer. First of all, uh, thanks to John Whitty for extending the honor of inviting me to uh, join this important conversation. And uh, second, uh, thanks to Al McDonald for making this possible and for making much else good possible besides. So Stanley has uh, given voice to his reservations about human rights. I'm going to start by wrestling with reservations of another Protestant theologian, my predecessor at Oxford, Oliver O'Donovan. In an article published four years ago, I argued against O'Donovan in support of uh, Nicholas Waterdorf's Christian justification of subjective rights, that is to say, rights attaching to human subjects. I now think that O'Donovan was more correct then than I then, then, then thought, albeit still less correct than he thought. So what does what does Donovan argue? In a nutshell, the object of his criticism is the modern concept of subjective rights, which are subjective in two senses. First, they are the aboriginal property of individual subjects, and second, they make no reference to any objective moral order. What's the problem with this? As Donovan sees it, such rights grounded in the wills of individuals exclude social right and obligation and therefore corrode society. Insofar as the concept of an individual's right is tied to a Hobbesian account of human being and society, I think O'Donovan is quite right to protest. For dogmatic reasons, for theological reasons, Christians can't. And for empirical reasons, they shouldn't endorse a view of human beings as radical atoms, originally at war each with every other, and motivated basically by the will to avoid pain and death. Nor can Christians endorse the corresponding view of human society as bound together merely by positive contracts whose ultimate obliging authority lies in the basically private interests of the contracting parties. If the concept of an individual's right were inextricably bound up with such an account of human nature and society, then a Christian would have to repudiate it. But is it? Well, Donovan seems to think so, uh, since he feels the need to contest Waterstorff's claim 
that the concept of subjective rights is implicitly present in the Bible and in the thought of the early fathers of the church. Nevertheless, O'Donovan does imply that a distinction can be made between the concept of individual rights and what he calls modern, and I call Hobbesian, anthropology, when he admits that while the language of rights began to emerge in the 12th century, it was not until the 16th century that subjective rights made, and I quote, totalitarian claims to colonize and reorganize the whole sphere of justice. In other words, even according to O'Donovan, the concept of multiple individual subjective rights was alive and kicking for several centuries before it assumed its objectionable Hobbesian form. In my 2010 appraisal of O'Donovan's dispute with Walter Storff, I concluded that O'Donovan had failed to show that the concept of rights adhering to individuals is irredeemably bound up with Hobbesian anthropology and sociology, and indeed, that he himself implicitly admitted that it need not be. I still stand by that conclusion. Nevertheless, it is now clearer to me that O'Donovan had begun to identify an important set of problems with much contemporary rights talk. In his terms, the most basic of these is the conception of a right as an individual subject's aboriginal property without any reference to an objective moral order, in terms of which conflict between subjective rights can be resolved rationally rather than just politically. Implicit in this subjectivist account of a right is a view of the individual as originally and essentially asocial, which undermines the authority of social obligation. And from this follows a tendency not to view an individual's right as a prima facie claim that might be qualified subsequently by other such claims on objectively moral grounds. O'Donovan, I believe, is onto something important here. However, I think his diagnosis requires two qualifications. First, the fundamental problem lies not in the absence of reference to any moral order at all, but rather in the implicit reference to a moral order that has been radically reduced and impoverished. For Thomas Aquinas, following the Bible and Aristotle, human beings are essentially social. Accordingly, human flourishing, which generates the obligations of natural law, comprises a variety of goods, not only the individual self-preservation, but also his generation of children and his investment in friendship and society. For Thomas Hobbes, however, human beings are essentially isolated. Accordingly, Hobbesian human flourishing reduces, the single, reduces to the single good of the preservation of the individual self from pain and death, and natural law reduces to the single right of self-defense. The effect of this cynical, materialist view of human flourishing is not exactly to undermine all of, so, notions of social obligation and society, but rather to instrumentalize them. In the Hobbesian view, social contracts become merely the expedient instruments of individuals' pursuit of security, and the obligation to keep contracts is fueled by a combination of natural desire and practical shrewdness. So that's one qualification of O'Donovan. The other, the second one, is much more brief. Namely, that the problem isn't exactly that a right is seen as an individual's property, but rather that that property is seen to be absolute, precluding all other considerations. The assertion of a proprietorial right in this discourse marks the end of moral discussion, not the beginning. That O'Donovan's diagnosis needed correcting along these two lines became clear to me in the course of studying Hugo Grotius' reasoning about the morality of causing physical harm. Grotius' reasoning make, also makes plain that O'Donovan is wrong to suppose that the concept of an individual's right is necessarily tied to Hobbesian individualism and social contractarianism. Writing almost a generation before Hobbes, Grotius does affirm the notion of rights attaching to individuals, including that of liberty from bodily interference or harm. This natural right not to be harmed, however, is not absolute. Rather, it must yield to the overriding claims of the social good. For Grotius tells us, for example, and I quote, if one subject, though altogether innocent, 
be demanded by the enemy to be put to death, he may, no doubt of it, be abandoned and left to their discretion if it is manifest that the state is not able to stand the shock of that enemy, end of quote. Yet the reasoning here is not simply that the urgent requirements of the social good trump an individual's right. More subtly, Grotius argues that the virtue of charity or love sometimes obliges us not to assert our right, but to prefer the good of many to our own private interest. In this particular case, therefore, it obliges the subject to surrender himself voluntarily to the enemy. Moreover, if he will not do so voluntarily, his sovereign may force him, since sovereigns may generally force their subjects to do what charity obliges. For example, Grotius says, in time of famine, to bring out their corn. In Grotius' early 17th century thinking, therefore, Christian ethics had come to think of individuals possessing a natural moral right against physical constraint and harm. But this right was understood in relation to a larger objective moral order and therefore as not absolute. On the contrary, it's highly contingent upon the right bearer's moral innocence, upon the motives and intentions of other agents, upon whether harm is a last resort and proportionate, and upon what are his social obligations under charity. In other words, in Grotius, we find an affirmation both of an individual's right and of its contingency upon a range of other moral factors. All of these factors ordered together constitute objective right in a given situation. Depending on the circumstances of the situation, objective right might or might not include a subjective right. The rights of individual subjects are prima facie, not ultima facie. However, there are rights and there are rights. On the one hand, are natural moral rights that obtain outside the jurisdiction of any effective settled legal system, for instance, in virgin territory, during a collapse of civil order, or in a theater of war. On the other hand, are positive rights, granted by a particular legal system or by international treaty, and backed by the threat of coercive sanctions. Now, this, it seems to me, is a very important distinction that goes unacknowledged in the odonovan waltersdorf debate. The highly contingent, unstable right not to be harmed, which Grotius affirms, is natural and moral. It's unstable partly because its existence depends on a variety of contingent, morally significant circumstances, but also because the fate of its recognition lies at the mercy of the consciences of the relevant parties. Since private consciences have been known to err, positive legal systems deliberately transfer much, if not all, of the room for discretion onto public courts, strengthening the presumption in favor of the right and so stabilizing it. Such constraint of the discretion of individuals comes at a certain social cost, but it's a cost that society judges worth paying. The rationale for the granting of a positive right, it seems to me, often involves a prudential judgment of this kind in which the social costs are considered and reckoned affordable. Take, for example, the right against torture. In one sense, there is obviously a moral right against torture, insofar as torture means the wrongful, deliberate infliction of harm. Of course, one has a right against a kind of action that is wrong by definition. But what exactly is it that makes torture wrong? Since I am a proponent of Christian just war reasoning, it follows that I believe, and if you're not a pacifist, you believe too, that under certain conditions, such as right motive and intention, last resort and proportion, it is permissible, morally, for someone deliberately to perform harmful acts that he or she knows will have the effect of punching bloody holes through other people's bodies, tearing limbs off them, wrenching their heads from their shoulders, or causing them simply to evaporate. So when I come to the issue of torture, what is immediately striking to me is that the kinds of physical and psychological damage that torture involves are not necessarily and obviously graver than those per permissibly inflicted on the battlefield. This raises the question, if it can be morally right to shoot or dismember an enemy soldier, why can it not be right to subject a terrorist prisoner to verbal threats 
sleep deprivation, or waterboarding. If torture is immoral, then it does not seem to be because of the objective harm that it does to the tortured. And here I disagree with the views of Jeremy Waldron and my colleague uh, Jean Porter, for both of whom torture is intrinsically evil, in part because of what it does to the victim. I've explained elsewhere and at length why I disagree with them. In a nutshell, I'm not persuaded of two things. First, I'm not persuaded that any act that chooses to inflict pain in order to force a change of will is as such objectively evil. That, for example, is exactly what I'm doing when, having brought the mugger to the ground, I twist his arm up his back until he releases my wallet. Punishment is usually about forcing wrongdoers to act against their own will, and sometimes punishment may even take the form of the lethally destructive force of war. That's my first reason for not agreeing with Jeremy and Jean. Second, I'm not persuaded that, that all deliberate infliction of pain is as such subjectively vengeful or sadistic, suffering no limits. It seems to me that some kinds, for example waterboarding, could in fact be well motivated, rightly intended, and disciplined by the requirements of proportion. For these reasons, therefore, I distinguish between sadistic torture and non-sadistic aggressive interrogation. About torture, there is nothing further to say, except that it should be abhorred. But what about aggressive interrogation? If the wrongness of aggressive interrogation cannot be located either in what it does to the victim or in the motivation of the agent, where else might it lie? One reason, one non-intrinsic reason, why it might be immoral is that it doesn't work. That is, it doesn't produce information that can be relied upon. But again, as I've argued elsewhere, the evidence suggests that aggressive interrogation can sometimes work. If that is so, then to refrain from it, all other considerations apart, is to weaken one's social defenses. It is to incur a cost. Still, there might be prudential reasons for bearing that cost. For example, crucial to winning a counter-terrorist campaign is the business of draining the swamp, so-called. That is, of robbing terrorists of popular support, of winning hearts and minds. That is certainly a major consideration in present British counter-terrorist efforts to suppress homegrown Islamic jihadism, given the showing of the 2006 popular survey that 13% of British Muslims regarded the London suicide bombers of the 7th of July 2005 as martyrs. That 13% amounts to over 200,000 people, which is a much, much larger pool of supporters and potential recruits than that ever enjoyed by the IRA in the recent troubles in Northern Ireland. So if British government were known to subject terrorist suspects to aggressive interrogation, even of the non sadistic proportionate kind, its efforts to woo British Muslims would be severely damaged. This fact, therefore, gives the government a strong political prudential reason to eschew such interrogation and to grant all British citizens a positive right against it. There are other prudential reasons. While I don't think that the practice of aggressive interrogation necessarily corrupts the interrogator or the institutions that support him, there is certainly a high risk that it will. And if your anthropology is Augustinian like mine, not exactly pessimistic, but falling a long way short of starry-eyed, that risk will appear to be high. Insofar as the libido dominandi, the lust for domination, is a widespread human motive, insofar as we human beings take deep and frequent pleasure in the sheer domination of others. The psychological forces tending to make the practice of aggressive interrogation a source of individual and institutional corruption are great. As I see it then, the rationale for the granting of a positive right against both torture and aggressive interrogation contains judgments about prudential considerations, and it is upon these judgments that in my mind, the rationale stands. Prudential features, however, wax and wane according to circumstances. It will not always be the case that aggressive interrogation is politically counterproductive or corrupting any more than it will always be sadistic. 
Therefore, notwithstanding the prudential wisdom of granting a positive right against aggressive interrogation, there is no correspondingly absolute natural moral right. Accordingly, there might arise an extraordinary case where a conscientious interrogator judges that the stakes are so very high as to warrant the use of aggressive methods and so the violation of a positive right against them. And morally speaking, he might be quite correct. In support, I observe that even a card-carrying liberal philosopher such as Henry Hsu concedes such a possibility, uh, and uh, so does implicitly Jeremy Waldron. In such a rare case, the interrogator should follow his conscience, render himself accountable to the courts, make a moral case for his law-breaking, and entrust his fate to the discretion of the judge and jury. Positive rights often contain and stand upon prudential judgments about social costs and their affordability. The prudential nature of their rationale makes it possible to argue in rare cases that extraordinary circumstances justify their violation, morally speaking. Again, I call as friendly witness Jeremy Waldron, who writes, quote, there are very few philosophers who believe that rights should be utterly impervious to very large changes in social costs. My impression, however, is that lawyers, or at least, or at least human rights advocates, sometimes they're the same thing, sometimes they're not, that human rights advocates do tend to regard positive rights of all kinds as absolute and so impervious to morally significant changes in circumstance, with the result that their jurisprudence sometimes becomes imprudent. And imprudence, you will remember, is a moral vice. As illustration, I offer the following example. In 2011, the UK government began to propose the introduction of so-called closed material procedures, or CMPs, into ordinary court hearings of civil cases. The reason for this was that former DTNAs in Guantanamo Bay had brought a civil claim for damages against the UK government, which they alleged had been complicit in their illegal detention and ill treatment by foreign authorities. In its defense, the government had wanted to use material that had been gathered and supplied by US intelligence agencies. However, however, it could not use this material because its public disclosure in open court would seriously, seriously discourage the US from sharing intelligence in the future to the detriment of British national security. Consequently, the UK government had been forced to settle out of court. This not only involved considerable public expense, but also robbed the government of the opportunity to have its name exonerated. Hence the proposal to introduce the CMP. Already used in other circumstances, this procedure would involve part of the court's proceedings being held in secret. In this secret or closed sessions, the intelligence material would be presented to the judge and to a security cleared special advocate of the plaintiff. This advocate would be allowed to provide the client with a gist or loose summary of the material, but would be forbidden to reveal precise details. At the end of the proceedings, the court's open judgment would be supplemented by a closed one. The government's proposed uh, pr proposal provoked vociferous criticism from, from the, the legal profession and far more opposition than support. The most fundamental criticism was that it, that it threatened the basic principle of open justice. Now, I don't intend to uh, assess the argument about the uh, propriety of this proposal. I simply want to observe that not a little of the legal rhetoric deployed implied that the CMP proposal would involve a fundamental betrayal of justice. Thus, for example, Philip Sands, barrister, human rights advocate, and professor of law at UCL uh, in London, argued that the, uh, the government's proposal is, quote, wrong in principle and will not deliver justice. The bill threatens greater corrosion of the rights of the individual in the UK, end of quote. So far, it appears so uncompromisingly principled. But let's look again. The statement that the government's bill is wrong in principle and will not deliver justice is preceded by the phrase, under conditions prevailing today. And the whole sentence in which it appears is preceded by these two. There may be times when the country faces a threat of such gravity that the exceptional measure of close proceedings might be needed. This 
is not such a time. Now, that whole statement requires some critical reflection. Sands concedes that there might come a time when the introduction of the closed material procedure would be justified. But if that is so, then how exactly is it wrong in principle? Moreover, if the CMP could presumably deliver justice in those circumstances, why can it not do so now? What these symptoms of inconsistency reveal, I think, is the overreach of the rhetoric of absolute principle. What Sands should have said, I think, is that the CMP makes the court proceedings less than optimal, that it weakens without altogether removing the plaintiff's power to defend himself, that it reduces without altogether abolishing the transparency of the court's judgment, and that it raises the risk that public confidence will be lowered. In short, the CMP does, so not, does uh, not so much contradict the principle of open justice as compromise it. It isn't so much simply unjust as less securely just. The issue, I think, is not one of principle. It's one of risk. So there are safer and riskier ways of trying to do justice. But justice can still be done in riskier ways. Here I call, as friendly witness, a candidate even less likely than Jeremy Waldron, Eamon Collins, a member of the IRA, who was, by his own admission, responsible for the murder of a policeman at Point Blank Range. In 1987, Collins was brought to trial in a Diplock court in Northern Ireland. Diplock courts were introduced in the early in the 30 years long troubles to overcome the problem of the terrorist intimidation of jurors in cases suspected of involving paramilitary activity. In such courts, the right to trial by jury, that right enshrined in Magna Carta, was suspended, and the accused was tried by the judge alone, although counsel for both parties were present to test the evidence. The Diplock system was abolished in 2007, but while it lasted, it was, of course, highly controversial, and its procedures were far less safe than normal ones. Did this mean that justice could not be scrupulously done? No, it did not. In his autobiography, Collins tells us that the judge before whom he stood strongly suspected his guilt, but that he nevertheless dismissed the case on the ground of a legal technicality. In a chapter entitled, Their Justice and Ours, Collins describes his reaction, and I quote, the judge's words had set a real shock through my body. I felt peculiarly emotional about them. The law had revealed its genuine dignity there could be such a thing as the impartial application of the rule of law. This judge had brought to life for me, even though he loathed the IRA, principles which were important boundaries between civilization and barbarism. The implied judgment of what I'd been doing for the past six years was one that I absorbed, and the contrast with our revolutionary justice was extreme. Even though he suspected that I was as guilty as hell, he was willing to let me walk free on grounds that many people would have regarded as a foolish abstraction. This civilized idea, this majestic abstraction, had set me free. When the reality has sunk in, I knew I really could abandon violence because the system, for all its manifest injustices, carried within itself the possibility of justice. When British justice worked, it could still represent the highest achievement of a civilized society. I could feel nothing but admiration for this judge, Mr. Justice Higgins, who on a such a fragile legal abstraction had set free a man from an organization which even during the trial had tried to murder him by firing a rocket at his home. All hail to Mr. Justice Higgins. Even in the less than optimal judicial proceedings of Diplock Court, where the court's judgment was not the expression of the common mind of a plurality of jurors, a conscientious judge, notwithstanding severe personal provocation, could still scrupulously permit the letter of the law to acquit a probably guilty man. And even in those procedurally less secure conditions, conscientious judges might have, and probably did, acquit the innocent and convict the guilty. I conclude. To summarize, a Christian is bound to insist that rights talk have reference to a larger, given, created, natural moral order. The elements of this order, goods, social obligations, proportionality, motives, intentions, can qualify the rights of individuals. 
they are most likely to qualify natural moral rights, which are highly contingent and unstable, fading in and out of existence according to circumstances. But they can even qualify positive rights in extraordinary circumstances. The rationale behind the granting of positive rights sometimes, perhaps often, incorporates a prudential judgment about the tolerability of social costs. The cogency of a prudential judgment is contingent upon social circumstances, and when those change, its cogency might weaken. Rights are not always trumps. Christian anthropology conceives the flourishing of individuals as social. Individuals flourish in gladly and fr freely meeting their social obligations, even unto death. Therefore, morally speaking, social obligations can trump individual rights, or rather, it can cause them to vanish. And since Christian anthropology also believes in sin, it believes in punitive coercion. Sometimes, where a sinner refuses to meet his social obligations, he may be forced to do so, even by suspending his positive rights. For example, as Grotius says, in time of famine, the private citizen's moral right to own a surplus of grain and withhold it from the market lapses. What's more, since public authority may compel the release of grain, the corresponding positive right is suspended. Had the British government in the 1840s so compelled Irish landowners, the horror of the Irish famine might have been relieved. Are all, pos are all positive rights susceptible of suspension in extremis? I'm frankly not sure. I haven't thought about this long enough. Obviously, a right against treatment that is by definition immoral is necessarily absolute. For example, sadistic dis disproportionate torture. And I cannot imagine how social exigency uh, could ever justify the suspension of a right to racial equality before the law. So I will not say that all kinds of positive right are susceptible of suspension by social obligation. Nevertheless, I think that some are. Notwithstanding the political rhetoric of their advocates, the positive rights of individuals to trial by jury and to know all the evidence against their civil cases are not absolute and can be trumped by the moral social obligations to which extraordinary circumstances can give rise. And even if we think it wiser, as I think we should, never to suspend the positive right against aggressive interrogation, courts should nevertheless be prepared to recognize somehow extraordinary cases where such interrogation is morally justified. That's where I finish. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.